Well, welcome to Jim Derrick's School. Thanks for coming this evening for, uh, hopefully, uh, informative, interesting, lovely. <laughs> don't know what other description words I could use. But uh, thanks for coming, and uh, I'd like to introduce to you artist Francis O'Neill. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, oh, I've got to try and do the thing, so you might have to give me a... Okay, I'll give you a nod. Yeah. Um, um, hi, everyone. Uh, Hello. All right. I'm, I've not done the, the, this talk before. I've not done. Um, I've gone through this with anyone. So if you do have any questions, you can just wave at me, and we can ask them. I don't mind being interrupted, and hopefully, can make it a bit more sort of informal or conversational, right? But I'm going to go through a few things, and just, and hopefully, um, hopefully, it will be interesting for you. But do interrupt if you feel like there's something that's not clear, if I'm, you know, not speaking loud enough or something. I like just wave at me. All right. Um, I just wanted to first start with a little bit of an introduction. Um, about how I came, because we're going to talk about the trajectory of how I came from doing paintings and being like an art student and getting to the point where I'm researching about Rembrandt and how he might have used lenses for his, um, for his, for his work and his paintings. Um, I, I initially just went from school to do a foundation course because probably I, I didn't really know what else to do. And, um, and um, I ended up doing the foundation course over two years and then going on to university and, and it's some of this work that Tom's um, nudging through here. Just to give you a little idea of the sort of work that I was doing and, and how that I came to sort of have an understanding or how I was obviously at the time looking at old masters doing chalk drawings and trying to get my skill level to a, um, to a, a sort of a level that I felt was comparable. You know, like if you're going to do something, I had this idea that you have to do it well because you want to make money, you just don't want to fall off a cliff like a lemming at the end of university days and, and then, you know, be uh, working somewhere you don't want to be working. So. So I, was doing, uh, I spent a lot of time in the life room and I spent a lot of time uh, using models that were available at the colleges I was at and a few landscapes and stuff. So I got sort of fairly familiar with the materials that I was using and, and, uh, and different ways of uh, making the work. Um, so this, this, my, my training then lasted about five years and then I went away for a bit and you know, as people do, they got a round wheel ticket or they do doing odd jobs and things. And, I came to, and when I came back, someone had videoed um, from the television a documentary by David Hockney, which was called Secret Knowledge. And Secret Knowledge is a film, you can still watch it on YouTube, it's in two parts on there, it's about an hour and a half long. And um, in it, David Hockney comes up with a theory, he looked at Old Master's work and he decided that some of the drawings looked very traced, like an Andy Warhol tracings that he'd seen in the 60s. And um, he, he decided that that was, uh, but some of them seemed a bit too good to be true and he started to look into it and he found that they could have, um, in, in some periods, been using optical devices called camera lucida and the, the, the artist in question that sparked him off on this quest was um, called uh, Jean Anger, okay? He's a French portrait artist, He's, there's paintings of his in the National Gallery in London and his pencil drawings are very, very small, very, very immaculate, amazing drawings but, and very, very um, beautiful and sensitive little drawings but also the, the drapery in them is very fluid, very fluid drawings. So uh, David Hockney looked at that, and um, you know, I, 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 and, and this guy videoed for me. I watched this video, and I'd been training, like as you can see, the things behind me. I've been training really hard to try and get good at it. And I thought, oh, these guys are just cheating, or they're just using optical devices. The, the, the skill level isn't the same. Now, my opinion is sort of um, uh, mellowed on that score, as I will show you later. But um, but that was that was my first awakening to the possibility of the use of lenses in old master paintings. And um, there was, Hockney did this research with a guy, a physicist called Falco, a guy called Charles Falco from the University of Arizona. And I presumed, I mean, at, at the time, um, Hockney excused people like Rembrandt. There was two people he excused from using the, lens, the lenses with their work. One of them was Rembrandt and one of them was Leonardo da Vinci. And I had no reason to doubt these guys. Like, uh, Charles Falco was a physicist, Hockney's this big deal artist. Um, but at the same time, when you look at a Rembrandt painting, for example, all the features in the painting that give you, um, that Hockney was claiming uh, showed evidence of the use of optical technology were in Rembrandt's self-portraits. And, and what Hockney had said was that Rembrandt couldn't have used lenses for the self-portraits. But I looked at him and thought, well, they've got all the other features that you justify your theory on. So how could he have been doing that? Was that just a choice? Was it a stylistic choice? Didn't really get that. That didn't really make sense to me. And at the time, I thought there must be a way of bouncing the light around so that you can see yourself. But I hadn't played about with lenses and mirrors. I hadn't a clue. 
Um, and these guys were physicists and artists who'd put lots of time into it, written books about it, made TV documentaries about it. So I presume they were smarter than me and um, th they would have sorted it out if, they, if, if that was a thing. And, and, and I left it like that. So I thought I'll, I'll carry on doing what I'm doing because that's the way the best guys did it. That's the way Rembrandt, they all did it by eye. So I carried on in that vein, all right? Um, so some years passed in that and I'm, I'm investigating. Uh, some of these paintings that you see behind me, like this one is from very early on, like a foundation course. Um, they're all done in a certain way with the way people work with paint now, which is they buy uh, oil in tubes and then they use turpentine with them, things like that. I wasn't getting the same effects. That I could actually see physically the paint wasn't moving in the same way as, um, as, as, as you could see in old masters. It just didn't look the same. You put one of mine, mine looked drier, theirs looked luminous and sparkly and there was thicknesses and sort of consistency to the paint that you couldn't get. And um, so I started researching that and I found a few things out and it ended up corresponding with a chap in California over the internet. Um, and eventually one day he talks about projections. We were talking about different things and he, he emailed me and he said that you could see projections on aluminium foil without being in a completely dark room. And it was that point and straight away that I knew um, that if that was possible, my little idea of bouncing light around could be possible if you didn't need to be in a completely dark room. Because the whole problem with doing a self-portrait with uh, uh, David Hockney's optical um, projections is that you had to be in the light and the dark at the same time. So if, if, if the artist is painting something, the subject has to be in a bright light and the artist has to be in the dark. If he's painting a self-portrait, he can't be the subject and the object. He can't be in the light and the dark at the same time. So as soon as I knew that you didn't have to be in complete darkness with aluminium foil, I had this little like, eureka moment. I thought, well, maybe it's possible. So he told me about you can print, um, project onto metal and be visible. So I started to project onto aluminium foil uh, on just, with just two little, um, with a concave mirror, a little, a little um, ladies um, compact mirror that I split in half. One was a flat mirror, one was concave, and I was able to project myself onto that, and that's what happened. So I, um, at the time, I was chasing the BBC because they'd, I'd made a program, um, or I'd sent them an idea for a program, and there was, I probably shouldn't say this if we're going to put it on the internet, so I'll, I'll just skip what happened with them. Um, but I was in discussions with them, and um, with the BBC, and, and I'd got in touch with them for some reason, and, and they said, have you got any more ideas? So I gave them three ideas, and one of these was this Rembrandt idea that he could have done his self-portraits with uh, uh, projections. And they, they, um, they, well, we went through their selection process and we got past their selection process and then they ditched it without any explanation. So at that point I was thinking, what am I going to do with it? Because I'd put a lot of bit, they'd asked me to do work and come up with ideas, so I'd put a little bit of research into this bit of time into it. And I was speaking to a girl I know called Sophia, who's a physicist, and she said, why don't you stop wasting time trying to get through like selection processes for radio and TV and stuff and just write it as, and we can do a physics paper. And she said, I'll translate it into, because physics paper to me is like, why don't you write in Arabic or something? I hadn't a clue. Like, um, so she said, why, why don't you um, write a physics paper? So I said, well, I can give you the information. And she said, well, I'll translate it for you and put it into their format. And I, I didn't realize, because actually what we did in the end was not in gobbledygook. It was, it was fairly uh, legible it was quite, for the layman. You can read it. It's like a, but, but it did need to be put into a format. And then Sophia did an, an amazing job translating my um, ramblings, basically, into a coherent uh, and presentable paper. So that's the way it went and then um, and that's how that's how we ended up that's how, how we ended up doing the, the paper that I'll introduce you in a second. So if we it's gonna so this is the start of the research now. So I've got little chapters for you. That's my first chapter. That's the intro about how we get in for a for a little bit of biography. And then we're not doing this one, we're doing the other one, Tom, which is hang on, careful. There's um there's a uh, yeah research I think it's called. No, that's no, that's the same one. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes, and you go back to the beginning of those. Don't look. Don't look. Don't look. <laughs> don't look. <laughs> this is the first time so you're getting it fresh. The first time we've done this talk, so. So, um, the, oh yeah, this is this is uh, this is a, this is my cue up here now. So when um, I, we've gone from, from from doing my degree and everything, I've ended up in a studio and I'm uh, working. And I've done lots of other things. I've done. We've worked here at Chandera and we did. Um, I've done paintings from my sketches. I've done p lots of sittings with people. I've done. Uh, so I'm getting more experience as a painter. I'm sort of moving on a little bit. And then I thought I'd try um, a self-portrait again because I, you know, I probably didn't, couldn't think of anything better to do that day. You know. But I did um, a self-portrait and, and what was apparent to me was that I couldn't transfer the level of what I felt, the level of skill that I had 
um, you know, I'm doing a bit of teaching and stuff like that, and I could demonstrate for things. I couldn't transfer that skill to the same level, to the self-portraiture, with the same ease. Because when you're drawing something that's uh, in front of you, it, in general, like if it's a still life or a person, or like you have a model in or something like that, um, you can move. They keep still, you move, you can do what you want. When you paint a self-portrait, you've got to lock your feet in position, you've got to work out where can you have the easel, where can you have the mirror, and you've got to make sure that you can see both and flick your eyes. And every time you move, if, if the distance between the, mirror, the, the painting and the mirror is too great, you're moving your whole head. And that becomes difficult. And, and you've also then got to, every time you look at the mirror, move your head just enough so that you're seeing the same distance beyond your nose or same, you're showing the same amount of both sides of the face. It's really tricky. It's a physical discipline. Even if, so it, was, it, it wasn't um, in relation to the skill level. It becomes a real physical difficulty. So um, I, 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 I'm probably, pr probably uh, bloody-minded or uh, stupid or... Uh, um, uh, persistent or something, but I tried, and this was the best effort that I got out of, like, of locking my feet and having the mirror and the thing really close together. And it, but it was arduous. It was uh, it's hard work, it's much harder work than painting other things. If we want to, so I had a few goes at this. Is this was one that was before the last one, and we, we flicked through. So then, then we come to the research. So I, so at this, it was around this time that um, Lewis told me about the metal, and I'd gone on a trip to the National Gallery as well around this time. I just, I just popped in or something, and I was speaking to some people, and we're looking at uh, the old paintings of Rembrandt. And I noticed um, one of the self-portraits I did, the first one of this, this uh, little body self-portraits that I did, was that it was, mine was very sharp-edged, because it had to be, because I had to lock myself in position. I had to know that the nose was going to end just there, the cheekbone was going to end just there, because otherwise, if I didn't lock the drawing down, it was wobbly and, and I wouldn't know what I was doing. So I, when I went to look at Rembrandt's, his were really fuzzy and kind of ethereal and um, out of focus. I had no, I was like him. So there was only two answers for me. One of them was, he was a genius and saw the whole world differently. And, or, um, he was seeing, what he was seeing was different. So either he's different or what he's seeing is different. So this is where we came. Okay, so we can just flick through these pictures now and have a look. So these, um, what I, so this is my studio, by the way. And then this is the doorway between a, a slightly darker corridor. So like a maniac, I was in the doorway playing about with my little mirrors and um, trying to create... And in, in one of the reasons that box was there was because I had aluminium foil at the back of it. So the box was shielding the... Uh, the sc was screening the actual projection surface whilst I played about with mirrors like this in this kind of way. So these are just little um, mirrors from uh, the, the chemist. So that's basically, if I stand here, the, the light would hit my face, then it would hit the far mirror, and then it would hit the near mirror, and then it would hit the, well, you see in the white wall of the box there, but I would have a, a board with aluminium foil. So these are my formative experiments with it. And I was able to see myself. And, and the lighting in my studio is not particularly conducive to doing this because it's a, it's a, a skylight, so that's why I was in the doorway. Um, hovering about, but if we move them along somewhere. So, th and this is another thing I discovered, if you put a lens on top of a flat mirror, it operates the same way as a concave mirror. And then um, I tried various things, I was trying to work out, what, these are, I'm not a physicist, so these are, these are my diagrams, they're one of, if we keep moving these along, like, um, the, these, um, yeah, just whiz through these, Tom, like five seconds each or something, but and I'll stop you if we need. Um, so these are just diagrams, so this one we'll stop at, we've got, um, I went through the book and uh, uh, books and uh, images on the screen, and um, this is, physicists like this, and I thought this is the most unscientific thing part of our paper, is that I, I um, measured because obviously all the paintings are um, w w um, different sizes. I measured the for the late late the late self portraits by Rembrandt are, are very big, they're, they're at least life size and quite impressive and imposing. So I wanted to see if there was a consistency of size. So I measured the. Uh, the images, I got images which had the full canvas on, looked at the ratio, the, the dimensions of the canvas and calculated what the real life, because so, obviously the, the, big, uh, the galleries are not going to let me have a look at the actual paintings with my tape measure. So I calculated as best I could an approximation of how big the faces were and they seemed to be around 20 centimetres, 21 centimetres. So there was a consistency of size there, there was, um, in his later ones. In, in the ones I, I used, I didn't even use all of them, but the physicists put that in the paper really. Um, so there obviously are uh, gaps in that. This one, uh, one of the winters when we started to, I started to research for, um, Sophia had said she would do the uh, paper. What you see there is um, a canvas and on the left hand side you can just make out the edge of the mirror and I, I, I blacked out, this is, I'm in a basement flat and I put blankets all over the window and then um, I've got a little mirror there and I was, a, I used a bike light just to, 
just to see if the, in principle, I didn't know it worked yet, in principle, whether if I shine a light from this sort of position, whether I could bounce it and it come out at the same size on the canvas. And, and, and so <laughs> I spent days moving easels around, but um, eventually I could show that the, the light ended up on the canvas. Um, and, and you can see the filament, the circle of the bright light and the filament in the middle. And when that was in focus, I knew you could get a focused image uh, that you could reach, close enough to, to reach if you're holding the bright light or whatever you could. So that's when I knew in principle it works. And um, this, the paintings have not come out as well. We could just keep moving through these very quickly. I think you're going backwards, are you? Yeah, the other way. Uh, there we go. So I ended up at the Oxford Printmakers um, and projecting onto copper. This is just the Oxford Printmakers, just to, to, to uh, show us a few things. And they, they lent me some copper pieces, keep going. And ended up um, with systems that worked. And these were my diagrams of the systems that worked. And I wanted to put these in the actual physics paper, but um, Sophia did some really nice ones with graphics. And this is um, the piece of copper, my image reflector. So what you're actually seeing here is a very difficult image to explain. But if, if you imagine you are me, so you're in the viewer's position, the top part of the image is, is a reflection in a mirror. So you're looking at your reflection there, and this is a projection. The projection is nearer to you than the mirror. So you can draw on top of that, and it comes out upside down. So these were my first images, and I'm doing this, uh, yeah? You've all got that one. Yeah, the, the, all the projections tend to come out upside down um, it, for, the, for the, the systems that I've created. Uh, Hockney's, um, basically, uh, what happens is, if it's in a camera obscura, if you've got a dark room and a light room, the lens goes in the middle, and the lens will always project upside down and reversed um, back left to right. Um, and you can, put, you can put a flat mirror and bounce it, which will correct the left to right reversal, but it always stays upside down unless you do it at an angle, so the light will come through the lens and you put your mirror like that and you can change it and then you've got it on a flat surface but you can change, the, the de you can change your situation in relation to the, to the tracing. Okay, okay let's see. I think we're nearly done, there's a few little, these are just a little collection of images, the best, I, I'm taking, what I'm doing here as well is I'm holding uh, one mirror and I'm taking pictures so it's a bit complicated to try and get the other, so you've got a fourth, um, <laughs> a fourth article in the way. Cause you've got to get the lights because if you put the light there, you can't see. If you put your camera in front of your face, you can't see your face. So you've got to get all your angles right. So these were not the greatest of pictures of the system. Um, and uh, this is me trying something slightly different with the bigger mirrors. Um, just whiz through these, Tom. Just like yeah, yeah. So they get, you get a sense of what I'm doing. Keep going. Keep going. And this is, this is basically, that was good, one of the system there. So you, you can, if, if you've got a mirrors on stands, you can see how that would work. You just sit at a position and there's, there's a copper plate. Now the copper plate in these pictures is not, um, is not, hasn't got a ground on which you'd put on for etching, but um, it works with the grounds. It works with all kinds of grounds and um, Rembrandt was supposedly used a soft ground, which is the one it works best on. Um, and if you look, um, I'm in the basement flat, which doesn't get direct light, so it's a really poor quality of light that we're operating in here. So if you've got a really good light source, which I have uh, got hold of now, I've got a room where um, I've been able to work, someone's kind of lent me a room, and I've been able to video much higher quality of projections. The, I was using copper rather than canvas because the light source is poor, so I wanted to see it clearly. So, yeah, so, but again, it's establishing the principle. If, if the etchings could have been done this way and look like they were done this way, there's every likelihood that the paintings were done this way. It's not, it's not a cast iron, but you know, you know, there's, that's the way my thought process is working at the time. Okay, quiz through these. Let's give you a sense of what my flat was like at the time. <laughs> Keep going. And this, this one was me just establishing the principle that um, you could do life size. You can't really see it, but um, there's a, that's my face upside down, life size. It doesn't come out very well. It actually came out better on the canvas, which I've not got a photo of, and we'll just move through that. And uh, there's Rembrandt, and he's, he's, um, this is a painting I used to look at quite a lot because I was at a university in Edinburgh, at the College of Art there, and you can wander in there to the National Gallery of Scotland and look at him at eye level. And to me, at the time, even with, this is before I knew anything about the projections, I used to look at this painting and think, why is he not looking at me? I don't know if, that, if it looks that way to you, or whether it's the power of suggestion and I'm going to hypnotise you into thinking that way. But when I was looking at it, before I knew anything about projections, I didn't think he was looking straight out of the picture. I thought he was looking slightly this way. <coughs> um, and these are more recent ones. That, these are my first goes in the, uh, in the better light, um, which I've now got videos which are up on YouTube, which you can have a look at, which are labelled Rembrandt self-portrait projection. And you can see them working really well. These are just a few little experiments. Um, 
and they come out upside down. This is a, an old dirty copper plate that I was using at the time just to test things out. We just whiz through these, Tom, and then we'll go on to the paper. One. That's one on there. This one is actually, that's a piece of copper with a ground on it that is much darker than the ground and, and much less reflective than the ground um, Rembrandt would have used. And these, these images um, are less impressive than the ones when you see the video of them when they're really clear. We'll just spin through that again. And that's on canvas, that's a small one, that's probably about a third of life size on canvas. That gives you a sense of it in inches. That one's not, um, that one's a, on a very poor light day and um, gives you a, just a sense of scale, but we've got some better ones again on video. This is just my little experiments, yeah, get a sense of that. So if the light is poor, if you're using um, small, uh, poor quality uh, mirrors, you get a weaker image. But as I say, on video, we've got strong ones. So these were my outtakes, if you like. Okay, and we'll move on to the paper. <clears throat> so this is the crux of it, really. So that's that's like um, that's how I how I got there. And then um, I'm going to walk you through the paper a little bit, just talk you through what what that paper explained. Yeah, here he is. <clears throat> so um, there are people who've um, gone through this uh, this work before me. And Hockney is one of them, uh, with Charles Falco. There's another chap called Philip Steadman who did some work in uh, 1988 on uh, Vermeer, which was on the BBC, and he uh, put together a, a program and built a reconstructed Rembrandt's uh, a, a stu um, studio. It's actually a bedroom in Vermeer, uh, sorry, sorry, Vermeer's studio, in, and it was in his Vermeer's mother's house um, that Vermeer had a room that he used, and. Um, they made a camera obscura. First of all, Stedman made uh, a small scale model. Then Stedman, with the BBC, he made, a, a, I think it was a life size or pretty close to life size model. And uh, Hockney's book and Vermeer's book uh, two, on two separate subjects, but related subjects, um, came out in 2000, 2001. So about the same time. And in their books, they both include um, a, a, you know, a series of um, quotes and extracts from literature which demonstrate that people knew about optics and lenses um, from the mid 1500s onwards and that's kind of indisputable there were books and uh, there's literature aimed at artists explaining how to use uh, lenses and optics um, it, it does go back earlier to some degree you've got uh, Leonardo da Vinci talks about uh, he has an awareness of the camera obscura and we only have a third of Leonardo da Vinci's notes so you've got him talking about the camera obscura, you have him talking about uh, projections, you have him um, uh, with diagrams and drawings of how to um, shape concave mirrors. Uh, and, and it goes, and con the use of concave mirrors, they were known as burning the mirrors, and they go back very far. So there's like a legend of Archimedes burning the approaching, I think it's the Phoenician fleet, with large concave mirrors, and they redirected the sun's rays to burn the ships. So, so people had known about concave mirrors and their certainly about their burning properties and the way they focus light. So there is, there is, there's some, there is some background to this. Um, and, and then you get the likes of uh, Vermeer and Rembrandt appearing uh, at a time when um, concave mirrors and uh, mirrors of different description and, and lenses and glassware becomes readily available in Amsterdam and in Holland. And, uh, and on all the places where um, there was glass making centers had some kind of painting um, connection Nuremberg and Venice is a particularly good example and there was there's a suggestion from people like Michelangelo that he's attributed there's quotes attributed to Michelangelo where he's dismissive of the uh, the Venetians uh, ability to draw and they have to and there's quotes from Italians um, dismissing the Flemish uh, painting style because it was mimicry you know it's imitation um, and they didn't know how to draw. Well, we look at those old Venetian paintings and those old Flemish paintings and we think they draw amazing. They've got amazing abilities, and, but maybe there was something else going on. Again, it's not, um, it's just suggestive of a different, why were they saying that they couldn't draw? Maybe they knew the way they were making the paintings. I mean, leave that question open. Um, <clears throat> Also, in relation to this, um, Rembrandt's students uh, Van Hoogstraten and, and uh, Carol Fabritius were known uh, to. I'm not quite there with these. So I'm a bit slow in this. Um, but um, <coughs> were known to uh, have have, ex have seen camera obscuras, 
um, used lenses, Van Hoogstra, and if you go to the National Gallery, there's a, a, one of these um, optical devices where you put your face and you can look and you can see a room. It's like a perspective trick box. Um, so these guys were not only um, aware of lenses, it's documented that they saw them, and Van Hoogstra, I think it's Van Hoogstra who wrote a book after Rembrandt had died about the uses of lenses and everything. And there's Carol Fabritius who, um, who paints a picture which appears to me to have been done using a fisheye uh, mirror or lens because it, it shows him looking around a corner the way you'd use the fisheye uh, mirror to do your reversing when you're coming out of a difficult driveway. He's got that kind of viewpoint in it. Okay, um, taking into the paper now, so if we go back one, if you can, Tom, um, we've got, these are, um, these are about Rembrandt's, uh, uh, Rembrandt's work in particular. Rem I've used Rembrandt as like the vehicle to demonstrate the fact that old masters could have used these, these um, techniques. So this one here um, is, a, is, is, is the first point that we make in the paper is that initially when Rembrandt is young, so he's, I think he's about 20 in this picture, it's roughly like 19, 20, 21. Um, and I always think of this as him laughing because he's found out how to do use the thing. He's, I think there's some kind of, you know, the, the psychology of this picture is that he's happy about something. Um, but I mean, even disregarding that, what, what we're looking at in terms of what we can observe and we can say as a fact is these are done on a very small scale, they're done on copper. Um, uh, there's, there's two or three paintings like on copper and this is one of them. And another thing about this would be the expression which would be very difficult to hold for a long time. Um, and it's quite muted in terms of um, the palette, which suggests it's done quickly. And the area of sort of central area of focus would probably be the face and the gorget there or whatever. But, but yeah, it's the scale really and the fact that he's painting on copper. Like I asked my question, why is he painting on copper? So if we go to the next one, um, this is Rembrandt uh, with his uh, wife Saskia. And um, initially, if we go to the next one after this, Tom, um, this is a better image of it actually. You've got, so initially, if you see the circle, I thought this was a central area of focus, and I'm probably wrong about that um, in a retrospect, but what, the reason I put that circle around it is to draw attention to the fact that there seems to be really strong drawing in, and uh, observational quality in the head and, and his, obviously his wife as well, his self-portrait head and his wife, but then he's totally out of proportion and the hand seems a bit weak, right? That's what I observe in it. Now, actually, if you're using projections to make an image like this, and there are more than one image um, version of this. So in this one, it's him and his wife, and it's him and someone else in another, and there's him with nobody. You would have to do um, the head and the background head separately. You'd have to do the self-portrait separate from the head because you have to refocus. So, but certainly, even if we disregard Saskia for a moment, um, there's something weird going on in the relationship of the head uh, and the hand for someone who can draw the rest of it that well in my opinion. So we just notice the next one. So these are about, we're talking about the facial expressions here as well, like uh, how hard would that be to hold even the sort of angle on his neck, whereas actually to see yourself at that angle um, or actually to create that face, you have, uh, with the projection, there's certain, fa there's certain angles of your head that you have to do and this is one of them, like if you wanted to look down at it, that your head would end up at that sort of angle. Uh, so how are you suggesting that he did this then? You're suggesting that you just captured one look? No, I'm suggesting that um, the difference between, okay, what, what, what we're exploring here is the difference between going from, um, as, I was, as I, was suggesting, as I was saying earlier, if I am painting um, or tracing myself from a flat mirror, the flat mirror has to be somewhere and I have to look back and forth from one to the other, even up or down, so my head moves, okay? But with a projection, what happens is the light would go from your face to uh, the flat mirror, which you can have small ones like this, set up something like this, and then back to the concave mirror and then to the thing. So you're always only looking at the, at the copper etching plate. You don't have to move. So you can pull all the faces you want and, and you're not moving. So you're tracing and not moving. That's my suggestion. So if the etching plate like this one is very, very small, it's like about five centimeters squared, something like this, you can actually put the flat mirror behind it or below it, probably maybe above it to the side, and the light can hit you and hit the concave mirror and come back, and it can look almost like you're looking at yourself because it's so close to the, the flat mirror. Yeah, did that, is that, you were there, okay. So, 
Because he doesn't have to move his head, basically, that's the key thing, because he's always looking at the copper plate at the projection. He's not moving back and forth to another visual image. He's always looking at that. He's tracing himself on there. That's what we contend, right? So we'll have a look at the next one. I go again. Yeah, so that's, it gives you an idea. It's quite small, but anyway, keep going. Um, yeah, so then as he gets better, he's, he, he tries more uh, um, ambitious things. But again, the head sizes remain quite small. And there's a limit to how big you can do the head, really. And what I find is that the, the, you get a sharper focus the smaller the um, image is. So if, if you're doing it on copper, it goes a bit diffuse and blurry. And if you've got a stylus or a point, a needle point, and you're scratching into your ground, you don't want to blurry things particularly. Although, if, if we can go back, Tom, we can just have a look. It is quite blurry still underneath his next one, next one I think there. There is a kind of blur to his cheekbone, uh, to his jawline, sorry, and on the right-hand side here and around there. There's not, it's not really that distinct where the, the hat and the uh, hair merge, okay? So there's certain little features like that which are characteristic of, um, but again, not watertight, but characteristic of the, uh, of the use of projections. And we'll move it along again. So this one is this one quite an interesting one to look at while we're here because um, in this one you can see on the book there's a kind of a shadow near his pen. Yeah, can you see that? Okay. Yeah. And I'll just while whilst we're on this image, I can we I suggest it. This one caused me a lot of difficulty looking at this, but how could he have used my system if he's using if he's drawing? flat on a horizontal surface. So he couldn't have, if, if that's an accurate representation. Um, but his head again looks too big for his uh, shoulder on, left hand, on our left hand side, on, on the viewer's left, on the right hand side. Um, and then there's, and I didn't know about that elbow, I hadn't spotted it. But that's, uh, the scholars have looked at that and in the notes of the British Museum, they report that they think that's his original drawing of his elbow, which makes sense because in order for me to set myself up doing that with my system, you have to be reaching across this way, and that's where your elbow would end up. So I didn't know that when, and I, and I was thinking that's the only way he could have done it. So I think he's conning us here that he's drawing horizontally. I think that's the point of it. I think that's the point of the image is to make you think that he's drawing on a horizontal surface so that he couldn't possibly be doing it. Whereas what, so he's actually been using deceit, in my opinion, in this one, to show that, that, and then in the later stages of the same etching, he widens the elbow, and the uh, the the, um, the shadow on the book becomes less visible. Okay, so he corrects the drawing where he's made it too narrow because it, that was the part that he invented. All right, we'll whiz along a little bit. Different versions of it. Yeah. Okay, and these are um, these are also small scale ones here. And actually, I think this is the first one of, a second point for the paper was that we think that he's, his eyes don't ever quite look straight out. So we just go through a few examples of this. We go to the next one. See, that, that's quite clear to me that he's not looking straight out at you. He's not looking at his, when you draw yourself in a reflection, you have to look directly at your eyes or he's looking straight back at you. And then you go back to paint. Now, obviously, he's working on a small scale and he could be making mistakes or he could like not quite get the needle away once it. But he's pretty good at getting the needle away once it on lots of other things. But the eyes are clearly to me on this one looking not directly out at the viewer. So I've put this, I've obviously put this paper out there and people just say, well, he's doing that by choice. And if you want to believe that, that's OK. Um, um, but there, were, there was a medical team looked at Rembrandt's uh, pictures and someone had obviously clocked this. So it was not, I thought for a long time this might be my confirmation bias. I'm looking for Rembrandt using uh, an etching system, a projection system, and uh, so I find evidence of it. But then I found like 10 years ago or something, there was a, a medical team had noticed that his eyes were looking out of the canvas at an oblique angle or out of the etchings, and they studied it and found it occurred in a really high proportion, something like, I think, um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like 47 of 50 or something like this. And um, and they thought he had what they called a strabismus, which is basically a lazy eye, a wonky eye. Um, because they couldn't, uh, I, think, I think they only found that one of his eyes wandered. But I think that's because they knew that he couldn't, would not have been able to see himself <laughs> unless he had one eye looking at you, looking straight out of, the, out of the, um, the system. But if we have a look at a couple more examples of this eye movement, I, don't, I think he's looking downwards there. I think he's looking below the, the, the mirror. I think he's looking to his left, our right of the mirror there. Um, he's looking to his, his left, our right of the mirror there. And the last one is the best one, I think. I think you can see uh, one of the best ones. 
I, I, if we go back to that one, sorry. This one here. This one is a sheet of studies. So this is much older. A lot of the other ones, a lot of the etchings he did, he did when he was quite young, and then he that sort of seems to be a bit of a fallow period or, or less prolific period with etching. So this one is, is a fairly late etching, I think. And you can see to me that he's, he's looking down, because he's not looking straight at you on this one. Um, and it's also interesting that the next next guy is a guy called Castiglione, I think, and he um, he manages to crack doing these amazing self portraits on copper on a small scale having seen Rembrandt do it, sort of, so, okay, <laughs> just like you do. So anyway, next one, let's have a look. Um, chiaroscuro, um, it's like Italian words, for, you know, for the high contrast of light and dark, um, so there's always a, a high, con and actually, not only is the high contrast of light and dark, this one as well, if you ever go to the National Gallery, this might not be the best image of it, although I think this is from their site, there we go. I think he's not looking at himself there, I think he's looking just fractionally. You, obviously you put your painting and your mirror as close as you can together, but to me his eyes seem to be looking. I've had people tell me that this isn't a strong point um, with the mirrors, but, but what, the way I look at it is that if you're looking for evidence of a system being used, then you look into the... You've got to look at for visual image of it. We don't have a... Uh, he hasn't written down for us that I used this projection system. So I'm looking for the paintings. You would expect, if, if the projection system was being used, you'd expect to see it in the paintings. And these are the little anomalies that you'd see. And with paint, it's possible to correct it, but to a certain degree. But if your drawing is set or, or um, placed in a certain way, it can be a, provide an influence on the subsequent painting. And I think that influence is seen in some of the self-portraits. Although people argue that you can do it any way you want to and you could have just chosen to paint himself looking laterally and obliquely out of the uh, um, image. And the medics found that he was looking um, to like something 30 degrees, at, as far as 30 degrees obliquely out of the image in a lot of the um, images that he painted of himself. So we'll have the next one. And that's another one which I've told you about already where I think he looks obliquely out of the image. Um, this one, yeah, this, I mean, all of these are examples of chiaroscuro. You can see in the paintings, there's always bright light on his face, which is a, a, a requirement of our system. You have to be well lit. The room has to be dark so that you're getting a projection. A bit like this, we've got a projection up for you here. The room has to be relatively dark and our lights have to, have to point in such a way as they're not making the projection uh, less visible. So he has to... He has to be in bright light to be seen. And there's a possibility on this, um, I don't want to stretch this point too far, but um, those pupils look, the irises, sorry, they look wide to me. They look kind of a bit doe-eyed um, when, once you're looking for these things, um, particularly the one on the right. And, and if, if, you pay, if, if you imagine the, 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 the process through which I, I'm assuming that he worked, is that he would uh, paint himself and his eyes would have to be looking at his canvas and the, the, uh, the, the lens recording image to the side of his canvas. So when he, he'll paint an initial lay-in, whether it's, I don't know how far, that, uh, he would get as far as it was useful for him to use the projection. And then he could correct that without the projection. And so the corrections could lend themselves to things like the eyes being slightly wider if you wanted to make it look slightly more like you were looking straight out of the canvas. Um, but that, I mean, again, again, you know, it's not uh, essential evidence. It's just an idea I've got about that one. The, the, the iris, and again, it could be an accident and it could be by choice that his eyes are, look, the far one looks quite wide. Okay, we'll do the next image. Okay. Um, yeah, so all of these are, are, are examples of chiaroscuro. Um, uh, the physical discipline, I think the last one as well, if we go back to the last one, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, because they, they, they all, they're all evidence for different points, you see, so they, they, they overlap all the time. But this, this painting, um, uh, if we're talking about the virtuosity of his painting, so we looked at the one of him laughing on the copper, and that's, so obviously to paint yourself laughing, whether you're projecting or not, there's a certain virtuosity, it's, it's, uh, you have to work at speed, don't you, if you're painting yourself with a laughing, smiling expression you'd have to be quick, you'd have to be good at it, because it's only so long even with, the, you know, even with the greatest physical discipline that you could hold a smile or your head cocked back and that sort of thing, or the, the one on copper where he has his open mouth and pursed lips. So there's a virtuosity to his mark making, okay? And in this one there is as well. And in, in addition to this one, there are areas of the painting where the ground shows through and just become part of the, uh, 
part of the painting, un unnoticed almost. So his first marks were sometimes his last. He hasn't built it up in all the places really heavily. And, and the paint, the quality of the way he's used to paint in this one when you see it close up is, is um, incredible for, 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 and for the accuracy of the marks. There's actually a, a quote about this that I'm, I would like to share with you, which is from a guy called Professor van der Wettering, uh, who is from the Rembrandt Research Project, and he writes books about Rembrandt. And he, he says this, skills developed through intensive practice lead to spontaneously executed movements that are very similar to reflex movements, which is true. What strikes me so much about Rembrandt each time, for example, is the extraordinary concentration with which he must have worked. This spontaneous hand is a self-evident and integral part of his artistic skill, a skill that is now scarcely, unimagin scarcely imaginable. Um, but he explains it in a, for different reasons. He says, the delightful combination of uninhibitedness and appropriateness seem to be dictated by the force which, with which that image is kept alive in the artist's imagination. And this is the, um, the, the key thing. Only great purity in the experience of the world to be, resem rep to be represented in a work make it possible to be what you make rather than manufacture it. This, I believe, is the only way to explain how the artist acquires this remarkable uninhibitedness which causes the spectator to feel that the work could only be this and not otherwise. So basically, it's quite a flowery language, but he's saying that only great purity in the experience of the world would allow you to achieve virtuosity of paint. And I'm saying, well, maybe we're just painting onto a template. And I, 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 one of them seems to me more prosaic and more um, credible. Like, than, He's basically saying it's otherworldly. And... Um, I don't know, art, art historians find ways to explain what they, they want to explain, but I think um, maybe we should be looking at something a bit more practical rather than saying that he was a different, like, uh, on a different world. Although then the argument would be that some people are just great musicians and they just appear and they're 12 years old, the virtual Mozart and people like this, or Stevie Wonder, whoever you want. Okay, um, we'll move on from that. These are maybe useful because we can have a look at the hands in them. Um, a lot of the paintings, um, obviously, obviously, if you're painting hands you can't, and doing a self-portrait, it's very difficult because you you're, you're, you're maybe hold the palette, you've got your brushes, and um, it's going to be a bit tricky, isn't it? So to, he does his hands collapsed a lot uh, like that. In this one is the, the one where uh, he has both paintings, the hands visible. And it is possible to do this with, etch with the, uh, the um, a concave mirror. You'd either need a big one, and I've actually got hold of a, a bigger concave mirror where you are able to see that, except... It's not quite the specifications that I want, but I was able to see like my whole head and face and hands. It was just a bit too blurry for what I would want to paint from it because um, it's not quite the right uh, focal length on it. Um, but I think there is a way to do it that way. Um, and you could paint your right hand in that position with your left hand on the thing and you could paint it that way. It would be, it would be um, tricky whichever way, whether you were using a projection or whether you were doing it uh, just from a flat mirror. But I think that... Um, the hand that is detailed is in bright light and the one that's not so detailed is in, in dark light, which is, again, something that we'd get with, proje with um, projection systems. You don't get very clear images in the shadows. So it's just, it's just an interesting little point. There's, something is going on there anyway to, for him to be able to paint his hands. Um, and as we saw, he wasn't really able to do it that, that well in the etching, wasn't it, to describe his hand that well in that one. Um, Let's have a look at the next image. Uh, yeah, this is, this is more like my setup when I'm doing self-portraits. I've got the canvas very close to me because you don't want to flick your eyes that much. Um, and then we'll have a look at the next one. I think it's going to be Van Gogh again. There he is. So again, you can see the canvas eating into the space because you have to have it so close. On the Rembrandt, the canvas is nowhere near. Um, that's, that's him showing you what he sees in the mirror. And you can see how the canvas has to encroach on the space because he has to keep his eyes really close because he doesn't want to move his head. You don't see that in the Rembrandts. Um, and the next one. Oh, this is an interesting little image because this is um, from Rembrandt's studio. And what you're seeing here is light coming. Uh, the, he's got the, the window over there, but the bottom shutters are shut. So you're in the position of the artist. So you, and I've been to Rembrandt's house and uh, there's no light behind you. Um, there's no, as in no window behind you. So you're painting against the darkness in a dimly lit thing, but why would you be doing that? Whereas actually that would be perfect for projection because then the light would come from the window 
um, or from that side of the room and you could uh, and it, you, the light from the window would not be on your projection surface. Okay, next one. Oh yeah, this is the eye directions again. So I've been giving you, I've been um, being as a, uh, this is Hans Baldung, <laughs> um, but um, the eye, we're just going to have a look at these. So my eye direction point is made about Rembrandt, and you can argue that away all you want, but then we're going to have a look at these. So all the old masters make the choice of not looking at themselves when they're doing self-portraits. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, next one. Central area of focus, out with of which there is much less detail and it becomes much more stylized. Next one, Titian, still not looking at himself. Next one, Titian. Veronese. Veronese. I mean, those last two may have been the other ways around them. I didn't put them in the paper because you could say that's a massive piece of work and he could have used... Um, assistants and things like that and his assistants could actually have traced his image for him and he could have painted it up or whatever but on the ones where it seems like there is only one individual making the painting they were clearly playing about with mirrors um, here you can see that and optical effects uh, Artemisia Gentileschi um, you know if she painted that without the use of optics she's very clever she certainly and, and you have to think about this in terms of if, if, if what I'm saying, if, if my projection system is not correct, if the idea is not correct, then what you've got here is a lady painting with um, two flat mirrors at least. And when you use two flat mirrors, you have uh, the, your, the distance. So when you use one mirror, if I'm a meter from the mirror, my image appears a meter in the imaginary virtual space. Yeah? So if you use two mirrors, whatever distance is between the mirrors is doubled. So she becomes smaller and harder to see. But maybe she used two flat mirrors. Next one. That's a tricky one to figure out, him and his mate. But they obviously had um, scientific equipment going on. Again, if you're using two flat mirrors, he'll become, the image you see becomes very small and it becomes difficult to do because in order for him to see what he's showing us, he has to have a mirror in front of him and a mirror there. So where is he putting his canvas? It becomes a very complicated system. This one I really like. Right, this one, because I've spoken to this chap, uh, Philip Stedman, who's been very courteous and, uh, and uh, engaged with me. Um, and Philip Stedman was the Vermeer man who showed that Vermeer was using a camera obscura. And um, this is uh, Dürer as a young man. Um, and he, he writes on this image that this I'm... At a later date, this I made when I was at it's different people say different things, 12, 13, 14. You think he, he, he says he's 14, but he might have been younger. Um, and he says that um, he did it using a mirror. And, and uh, Philip Stedman didn't like my uh, theory because it, um, he doesn't, because concave, although he believes in camera obscuras and artists use camera obscuras and projections, he says that um, there's no, in the literary record, there is no proof of the use of concave mirrors. Uh, for paintings, okay? So I said, well, there's a literary record on this image because he's written, I did this with one mirror and it would be very hard for himself to, to see himself looking in that direction or even from that angle with just one mirror. And he's written on it that I did it with a mirror. He didn't say with two mirrors or three mirrors. And I, I wondered whether he could have just done it with one concave mirror at this position and projected it onto his drawing surface like that. Um, so, um, but uh, Mr. Stedman didn't like that. He just, he, 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 he came, he told me that um, Dura was a genius and he could rotate it in his mind and he can imagine himself. He could look to the mirror and maneuvered it and manipulated it with his mind and his genius and put it onto the paper. But that isn't what he's written on the drawing. And it's also curious that the next image, oh no, he's not there. His dad does one. Um, we'll find it. There's his dad, which is exactly the same angle and um, setup, if you like. So they both chose to draw themselves from an angle which is really difficult to see yourself using a flat mirror. Okay, and if we go back to the last one, the one before that, you've got. Um, again, the chiaroscuro, he's not quite looking at himself, or on the bigger image, it doesn't quite show. And then we'll go through a couple of these. There might be a few more of these eye directions. The use of a curved mirror there to make a painting, quite clearly. 
This is the Carol Fabritius, who was a student of Rembrandt with his fisheye lens. It seems to me to be a fisheye lens. It, it might not be, maybe you could do that. Um, but it seems an awkward curve in it, um, if not. Okay. I'll have a look at the next one. This is Rubens. Um, you, what you find um, with a lot of the self portraits is they spend a lot of time looking over their nose at a really sharp angle. Whereas it's much, this is, you, this is with my system when I'm setting up and playing around with it. You see, when I've got the better images, this is the, uh, it's very hard to get them straight on. It's much easier to do them like this, where you're looking over your nose. Okay, we'll have another come. So this is Rubens, that's Van Dyke. Looking over his nose, there's Velasquez looking over his nose. Uh, Van Dyke again. Next one. That, sorry, Van Dyke was the figure looking over his nose. I presume you figured that one out. Yeah, there we go. So the last one was Rubens, that's Van Dyke, there we go. Okay, and then th those are just to give you an idea of, and this one he's clearly looking off to your left and the viewer's right, if you can see his eyes in the shadow there. Um, might be a bit hazy on the projection, okay. This one's quite an interesting one because um, I was going through, there's a book of Rembrandt self-portraits and um, I didn't know about this one. Um, and it was in the book, when, when I was going through this, like, I don't know how many Rembrandt self-portraits, and there's, because there's, it's not exactly cast iron how many um, uh, uh, self-portraits Rembrandt actually did, because there's copies and emulators and students and things like this, and people forging things. So, um, in the book, there's lots of them which we know are attributed to Rembrandt, where his eyes aren't quite, don't seem to be looking at himself. And this one, in the book, in, in the, the information underneath, it tells you that this one, they think, is not by him, because he's not looking at himself. And yet that would, to my mind, eliminate a number of them from the Rembrandt's oeuvre. Um, but they say because he's not looking at himself, they don't think this is him. Which that makes me think it's more likely to be him. <laughs> or by him, sorry. That's the next one. And that's him not looking at himself as well. That's in Melbourne. And the other one was in Vienna. That's an, but they, again, I, th I think they've proved this is him, even though they didn't think it was initially, um, because they've tested the canvas. Um, but there he is, not looking at himself anyway. Okay, he's looking out to the other side this time. Okay. And I should also say to give the opposite argument, so people will say, you know, that, that what I'm saying is not accurate, that you have, um, this is Rubens, and Rubens was a bit like a Hollywood uh, motion picture director. Um, they, he was doing all sorts, and amazing things like a size scale, battle scenes. Um, I think this is an important distinction we could throw in here. You, it, in, today we have people who can draw for, by eye, so we know they exist. We also have people who can draw from their imagination and they can invent uh, characters and animation characters and you know cartoons and illustrators and they can draw things from their imagination and conjure up a scene. So we know they exist. We also know that people nowadays use projections, whether it's um, from laptops or overhead projectors. We know they do that as well and people copy and trace things. This one here is um, Rubens, but there's no way, obviously, he painted himself like that. That's him with his wife and so somebody, some other force is involved there, whether it's his imagination, an assistant, or an, uh, some technology that we're not privy to. So the, the opposite argument would say Rubens could do that so he can draw himself any way he wants to. Um, but as with a, a film director or a, you know, the, the, it is, you can get assistance to hold the camera and you can get people to control the image in different ways, I would have thought. So, you know, it, it isn't cut, cut and dried. And, you know, obviously I'm giving one side of the, the talk here, one side of the story, but there's Rubens anyway. Tom's distracted. Um, but I thought I'd put that one in there because I've shown you a selected sample of people looking across the noses and he's also painting himself like that where he's, he's much more straight on. So uh, we, we, we don't quite know how that was made. Okay, we'll look at the next one. Oh yeah, this is another one. This is Velasquez looking across himself, I think. All right. Again, very sharply. All right, let's uh, have another point then. Um, This one is about, I think it's a virtuosity of the paint as well. Um, and you've got a few points in this one. 
chiaroscuro. Just lost my thread a bit with my notes here, but um, let's have a look at the next image for a Q. Yeah, it's the similarity of lighting, I guess, we're talking about here. Um, that one very young and one very old, and there's a similarity of lighting and position throughout. Uh, I mean, he does play about with lighting when he's younger, but there's a, there is a, a, a degree of consistency, both to the lighting, the lighting effects, the strength of lighting, the shadows, and the position of his head in, in, in his paintings. It's not, you know, cast iron. There's, there, is, there are some uh, variations early on, but he seems to settle into a pattern where the lighting's coming, coming from one side of his face, and he tends to look across himself a, a little bit like that. Okay. That's what the medics found, isn't it? With the strabismus, that's what they said. Um, but I wonder whether part of that is because, as I say, if you, if you lay in the image in a certain way with your eyes going one way, and then you get, and it's upside down at that stage, and you lay in and you get your broad proportions and you get everything, all the information you need, and you flip it back up the right way and you start to work from the mirror, and you think, oh, I need to make it look a bit more, you might get that kind of um, sort of disturbance in, in the visual image. I don't, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang my uh, argument on that. It's just, that's just, um, but that would be a practical outcome of using the system. You know, it would be a conceivable outcome of using the system. Okay? And, and you've got his hands there, the class together. And, and another thing to look at here is maybe we're talking here about the, um, the projected image and how it tends to be fairly a, a circular area of focus. So if you're making a projection using lenses or concave mirrors, there'll be a central area of focus that is particularly um, sharp and uh, informative and the rest of it will be slightly blurry. Okay, we'll just whiz through, have a look at the next one. And that central area focuses again, this is Leonardo da Vinci, it's what's called in uh, art history as the uh, first autonomous landscape drawing because it doesn't have any um, religious overtones and to my mind when I look at that you've got the very sharp dis uh, uh, distinction of the castle and the landscape but as you get onto the right hand side of viewers right hand side of the image you can see it starts to go a bit wonky and a bit blurry and the trees start to get up to a bit of LSD action over here yeah and the art historians say that that is da Vinci straining against the limitations of representational drawing I say that that was exactly what you would see and how you might record um, a projection should we have a look at the next one? Um, there, there again, you've got the central area of focus and it's blurry, low down. And also, you know, it's, and, and this one, actually this one, um, we can have a look at because in images like this, uh, Rembrandt is looking in the mirror. So if you imagine if you're right-handed and you look at that and pretend that's your mirror reflection, um, he has his palette in his right hand, is that right? So he's got. So we know that he's he's d deviated from the uh, the reality of what he's seeing with the hands, at least. And there's another painting in which that happens in Paris with Rembrandt and uh, at the easel. So he changed the hands, and we've seen that from X-rays that he's changed the hands about so that so that he appears right-handed to the viewer in the painting. Okay, so we we know that he corrected things, but we also know that the initial lay-in was dictated to by that reality. So that's, that's, I think, an interesting point for the projection idea, that he didn't just, if he could make it up, why didn't he just make it up from the start? He had to put it down one way, because he was using a, a projected image, I think. Okay. And there's the one at the easel. Again, he's, um, he's shown himself right-handed, which, and the x-ray shows that he's um, changed the hands around. Okay. These are his students. This is uh, Philip de, Jude, de Judeville who's, um, and you find that if you're standing in, in the projection system to, to get yourself to, to, to see yourself like that, you, you inevitably adopt this strange position to like change. You can, you can look at it quite naturally. The, the canvas will be here and you, the, your projecting mirror will be there. And if you want to make it a bit more straight, you end up with this kind of weird um, contortion of pose. And I think he's not very good at connecting the head to a sort of made up body, which he might have put on uh, a model or a mannequin. Okay, so, but also it just shows you that the, 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 what um, Rembrandt's students were getting up to. I don't think he's achieved the, the combination. Because I think they were using the projection in combination with uh, real life or maybe putting clothes on mannequins or something like that to do the bodies. Because you know, sometimes you've got complicated clothing. Um, 
and I don't think he's connected the two very well. It looks like he's got no shoulders and there's something strange going on with the, the angle of his head. We'll have a look at another one. And that's the same guy, Philip de Jodeville, and uh, uh, that's him showing himself laughing. Again, I think there's something a bit weird about it. And he has to turn back towards the light. It's, it's something that you'll find uh, if you use the system that in order to show yourself that way, you end up with this weird angle to your head and your shoulders. Okay. These are early ones where he's playing about with the uh, lighting and these are on a smaller scale but what these highlight for us is that when you make a projection um, or even if you're using an overhead projection or a movie projection at home the uh, brighter images show up better and the shaded images you lose a bit of detail and I think that's what is shown here yeah, and the next one as well you've got a lot of detail in the light and you can't see anything whereas human eyes don't work that way we look into the shadow and we adjust and we can see detail I can see your eyes now and you're in quite darkness but he, he, he loses a lot of detail in the same way as a projection would okay next one this is the virtual so paint I was showing you before um, there are some little gaps of grey within there um, you can see he's just whacked it down and it's almost it seems like around his mouth and just under his bottom lip is patches of grey which and just under the cheekbone, you can't really notice them. Maybe also underneath that swipe of paint at the bottom of his nose, there's a few bits of gaps, which is just the grey of the canvas showing through. And maybe just on the sort of wrinkle under his eye, there's a few gaps there. So some of his first marks are his last. He's just slapped that down, and he hasn't had to go through all that rigmarole. Or he doesn't appear from the, what we see there to have had that difficulty I found of the physical discipline of having to keep your head still. He's just really confident and knows what he's doing straight away, almost like he's painting onto a template. Next one. This is Carol Fabritius who achieves a similar, or a comparable, I would say, uh, skill. Um, he's one of his students. And again, the lighting is very similar to the Rembrandt paintings. And, that's what, and he's got the wide pupils, oh, sorry, wide irises, that kind of thing. And that's, funnily enough, Carol's brother, Barrent, was pretty good at self-portraiture as well. <laughs> and he didn't, I was, he may have been a, a, a pupil, but we're not sure. But, and also he's got the same lighting and he's looking down at himself in his, what would be an, a curious, difficult place to go. Yeah. Well, next one, we're going to have a quick look at, and we threw these into the paper um, um, at the end. Um, you know, no matter which way you look at it, Rembrandt was a great paper, a painter, because you, 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 even there is some reason why it's uh, different. And art historians will tell you that's because he made a stylistic decision not to paint that way. But this was also um, a massive painting and a, a big deal commission. And, and it was going to be seen from far away so that that could affect the way you painted it, because you might... Um, you might treat it differently because the viewing distance is different. But I, I, there's a little part of me, and it's, again, this is not proof of anything, it's a little part of me thinks that maybe um, he didn't have uh, either the studio or the money, because he'd lost his house by this stage, so he did, and he had a, a purpose-built sort of outhouse or um, shed extension put on to do the night watch, which is the painting before. And with this one, he was selling his wife's grave and I wonder whether he had the space to do it privately, to use his techniques, or whether, if it was painted in situ, whether he was able to use his techniques there, or whether he could pay for models, and so that he ends up making it up and it looks different. I think there's never just one reason. They just said, oh, because he, he wanted to. That's the reason they give for everything. He's a genius, godlike person, so he just does everything because that's his choice. So I just, we threw in a few uh, questions about that one into the paper. All right. And then the, we, there's another photograph of this, which I've not been able, which I've seen in books, but I've not been able to find um, to present to you. But if we look at the drawing of it, these cr create a little bit of curiosity in me. So if we can just draw your mind back to the ones where he's doing himself with pursed lips and funny expressions and things like that, they couldn't have been held very long. It's particularly the etching of him with the, the uh, sort of uh, umatron sort of face, you know, with his pursed lips. So this guy could, and there's pictures of him. Um, there's drawings uh, of him, really rapid drawings of, that he's done of people working and things like chopping up carcasses. And then this is of a sculpture which sits still. And there's not the same, you don't see the same level of accuracy in it. And I know he doesn't have to always draw the same way, but given that he can, uh, with really quick 
um, poses and shortly held expressions. He doesn't, he's not doing. Then the next one's, this is a painting that he saw in, and we know that he saw this in, a, in an auction house and this is the drawing that he made of it. We can flick back again to the uh, painting. It doesn't really even look like it for someone who's got that level of skill like it. I'm not saying that he has to every time, but in the ones, these are the only examples I can show you of things that we know what they are and what he drew of them. And uh, they don't demonstrate, and we did, he would have done this in the auction house apparently, so. Um, and there's that one again. And this one is a painting that there is something funny going on in here because this is apparently a self-portrait. It's called an artist in a studio, um, but if we think of it as a self-portrait, it becomes difficult to understand because um, it's a very, very small uh, board, and so it, he's not painting on the board that we see in front of us, um, and he can't paint from that distance. And yet, he and and the face is very weak in this one, and actually somebody else is um, sorry. Somebody else has painted in black eyes to make the eyes more visible later date. They put little two little dots in there. Um, um, so <laughs> that angle that you saw there in the painting is, is an angle that would be conducive to projecting with the light on the left hand side. Because if, if the angle that we're seeing, if you actually think about being the painter in that picture, your, the light source is to the left of you and you are, your canvas has to be against the light source. So you've not got light on your canvas, so it would be a, con a good place to put your reflecting mirror or your um, projection device. You can't, if you think about where you have to be to paint that picture and see that scene, you either have to imagine it or you're in your own, you're in your own light, you're in your own darkness. Okay. No, I don't think you have, I think it's easy. Oh, he's the man's here. Here we go. Does anyone have any questions at this point? I mean, I, I was going to wrap it up there pretty soon anyway. We pretty much through the the um, the paper there and uh, go on here. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was um, it was about a year, isn't it? It's about a year, is that right? I yeah, I, yeah, I was there. Yeah, I went to that. Yeah, we went. Um, I went to. Um, I went round the uh, galleries when I was doing between. I did my foundation course and my degree. Yeah, I was just going to show you this one. I mean, it's like you can see on this one. It's. Um, this is an imagined one, obviously. He's not, got those, he's not got someone to have their eyes stabbed out and stuff. But there's anomalies occur in the ones that are imagined, like the man's weird little armoured arm there, that you can see that just don't appear in his self-portraits. I mean, obviously, there's a difference in the scale and there's a difference in the approach and so on. But there are things in there that you'd think uh, a guy who, with that level of observational skill would think, can't put that arm in, it looks a bit funny and short. Just make it a bit wider, cover a bit of Samson's leg there. Wouldn't have cost him anything. I mean, it's a great painting all the same, but there are certain anomalies in it. Um, yeah. And th this is the, the uh, quick diagrams of my s uh, system, which you've seen um, on the pictures in the flat. You can see how it works, more or less, like that. These are ones Sophia did from my uh, biro drawings. Okay. That's, a, that's another one which we think Dura could have used. I mean, not necessarily could have used the... But because he says he did it with a mirror, that, you know, something along those lines. Um, and this is a way of varying, this is for the copper etch, the smaller scale ones. So uh, the, the, the ones with just the head would be the one on the left. And if you want to make the body, um, see more of the body, you push the flat mirror back and it gives you a slightly smaller image. Okay. And those are the diagrams. I just whiz through these, tell me. It's actually quite, uh, that's a, a template showing that they understood all this stuff. Uh, Johannes Kepler, um, this is a kind of a record of his findings that you can do various projections and it's the sun on one side and the projection on the other. 
showing that you, with different lenses you can get it upright. You can, he could even achieve, he was clever enough to do an upright image with uh, camera obscura, but not life size. It would be smaller, I think. Okay, and there's that's how we ended up, I think. And we a couple more maybe. Just there's a few more that I've thrown in here. Me looking cross doing it for somebody. you might like that. Yeah, you all got that? Yeah. Okay, we'll move on. And we'll just move on. I think there's some, there's just a couple of little things. This is, a, this is one that's very similar. It's not exactly the same one you've seen before. One of them is in Nuremberg, one is in the Maritz house. And a feature of them is that they uh, are both drawn from no, they, they both have no underdrawing. And actually, this was considered to be the Rembrandt because it's finer, it's more smooth and stuff, and polished and more finished. But they found out um, that this one has underdrawing, like uh, that they can, I think it might be in charcoal, but certainly has an underdrawing of a type that they can X-ray and see. And the other one doesn't. And so they now know that's the Rembrandt because none of his drawing, none of his paintings have underdrawing or evidence of linear underdrawing because he did like tonal blotches. And this is another thing that we find in Vermeer who we think used camera obscuras is that they didn't need drawing to position it because, and they didn't need to keep to that linear outline because they were just, in my opinion, um, painting onto the template given by the projection. So they didn't need that assistance. Okay. It's an interesting little point about that one. Okay. Is that we done? I, I was, I've got a couple of quotes from me uh, that I was going to just read out very quickly. That, um, um, a Giotto is another one, you know, like Dürer, who I was told that concave mirrors are not in the literary record. There's a quote about, um, I'll read it to you. It is initially perplexing that Villani tells us Giotto painted the double portrait with the help of mirrors in the plural. It seems unlikely that Giotto would have needed more than one mirror to paint a self-portrait. And why would he have needed any mirrors to paint Dante's portrait? One possibility is that Giotto used the mirrors simply to improve the lighting in the, way, in the same way that scholars place the mirror over their desk. But why would Villani even need to mention this relatively minor detail? So then the writer is called Hall and he's doing a book about self-portraits. And Hall eventually concludes that Villani's mention of mirrors um, can be attributed to symbolism or to an elaborate but, but vague metaphor. Because the, the self-portrait Giotto did was of himself and Dante, apparently. So Dante is the key for he had a vast amount to say about mirrors. Dante used uh, mirrors as symbols on 30 occasions in his writings. And Giotto, in Villani's account, has mirrors whilst in the presence of Dante, suggests that he is both Leah and Rachel, active and contemplative, and that his self-portrait is painted as a part of process of self-knowledge and self-love. So this information is given to people, but they choose to interpret it in the way they want to interpret it. You can't do anything about that. You just keep presenting the information. Um, and another thing, another couple of things is that, which are quite nice, is that um, uh, the remark attributed to Michelangelo mentioned, mentioned earlier, um, Flemish painting was concerned primarily with external exactness. They paint stuffs and masonry, the green grass of the fields, the shadow of the trees and rivers and bridges, which they call landscapes, and all this, though it pleases some persons, is done without reason or art, without symmetry or proportion, without skillful choice or boldness, and finally, without sub substance or vision. Um, so they were, that's, that, that's that dig about them. And Venetian painters could never hope to attain perfection in their art, since according to Vasari, they lacked the means of freeing themselves from their slavish dependence on nature and were forced to conceal under the superficial charm of their colouring their ineptitude at drawing. But we look at the Flemish painters and think, oh yeah, they're quite amazing. Um, Van Gogh said about Rembrandt's painting, would, um, one must die several times to paint like that. And you would probably have to die several times to paint like that if you were just doing it as you know, com we would think as conventionally uh, as you were doing it. Um, and he writes that what struck me most on seeing the old Dutch pictures again is that so many of them were painted quickly that these great masters, such as a Franz Hals, a Rembrandt, a Roysdale, and so many others, dashed off a thing from the first stroke and did not touch it, retouch it very much. Hockney said they are painted fast. Um, as he said the underlying precision is uncanny. He asked of Velasquez, Pope Innocent X, how did he paint that silk so perfectly so fast? Um, 
so these kind of quotes, I mean, there's a couple more here, I don't want to bore you, but I'm just rattling through them. The brush is not working at random, rather it adheres with extraordinary uh, fidelity to the system which the photographic reconstruction of the spatial situation called for. The areas are not determined by linear outlines, but by light and shade juxtaposed in an orderly way. The order is not that of direct vision, it is that prescribed by an image projected through a lens. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, uh, that's, that's basically it, isn't it? I mean, there's a couple more, but you get the idea. They, 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 these people have noticed this stuff and they can't explain it. And so, you know, we've put for an explanation which has not really been accepted by art history at this, at this stage. So uh, there are a, a number of uh, things like that. And, I, and there's, I've had quite a vitriolic uh, response to, but from some people like the guy I was talking about in California, we talked about how many paint, he's ceased to communicate with me because he thinks I'm a charlatan and uh, uh, after my 15 minutes of fame, whereas I felt I've presented this quite honestly and uh, gone through the uh, information as, as best I can. And as I say, Philip Stedman, who I thought might um, be willing to look at this evidence, and uh, which he has been, actually he's been very fair, but he does not see um, that it, he thinks it's conspirator like a conspiracy theory because it cannot be proven because there's no literary record of them using concave mirrors. So I've made the point to that that um, you can look at the uh, paintings and uh, uh, see things in them that are visual evidence, which is a first-hand primary document. The painting is a primary document in itself, which is equivalent to a literary evidence. And so if you look at that, then you can see the... And that's the way that I used to look at the paint. I used to look at the paint and think, they're using different paint to me. I wonder what's going on. And now they've done chemical analysis of the paint, which shows that the paint is different and they had um, egg in it and they had chalk in it and they had other additives in the paint that they used that has never been written down. So, you, so, so there is no literary record of the fact that they painted differently. So why would their other techniques be written down? So that would, would be the case that I would make there. Um, so that's pretty much it, I think, for the Rembrandt. And there's a lot, we were going to talk about a couple other things just to finish. Yeah. Um, but this reluctance of uh, the orthodox history to, um, even on just something as kind of inoffensive and uh, um, relatively unimportant as the way paintings were made, and then, because uh, in my mind, you've got two, two, two paradigms there. One of them is godlike figure, can do amazing things, and we know there are, we know there are people who can do amazing things. There's tons of them. There's skateboarders, there's musicians, there's you know, athletes, you know, there's all kinds of people doing amazing things all over the world. So we know they exist. But we also know that um, there's another paradigm whereby people uh, could be using technology. And, and they both seem equivalent to me. And the technology sort of emerged at the same time as Rembrandt emerged. So there seems to me that it's quite sensible to look at the possibility of two equal paradigms. Now, as part of, and I've become more, a bit more able to trust my, um, my research in some ways because uh, I had someone write to me and tell me that my, on the eve of its publication saying that what I was doing was not true and was false and stuff. And I said, well, I've seen it. You know, I've done these projections. I've photographed them. I've videoed them. Um, that's why I've got questions about other things now. About the way we perceive the world and the human story. Um, I've got questions about how did the BBC... Oh, oh, first of all, did you know that on a... On, uh, this is, I feel like it's my moral responsibility to take this opportunity to share this information with you. So we're going to spend five minutes doing this. I'm not going to keep you here forever. Um, but on 9-11, did you know three towers, three skyscrapers collapsed? Because most people only think there's two. Um, and it was reported to 23 minutes before it happened by the BBC. And it fell suddenly, symmetrically, and at free fall speed. So it felt like a controlled demolition. Um, and this is the lady doing it. Jane Stanley. And the building's still standing behind her. This concerns me. I've got questions. And we look at the next one. That's building seven there, that shiny one on the left-hand side, the picture of the left-hand side. It, building seven housed several financial institutions. It held, housed government agencies. It held the New York emergency um, where they were supposed to convene when there was an emergency. And you, oh, funnily enough, they weren't in there. Let's have a look at the next one. Steel structured skyscrapers have never collapsed due to fire in the history of mankind and three fell on one day on 9-11. These are recent, there's a Dubai one that was recent as well. And that was the fire, I mean there were fires in Building 7 and, and that's the official explanation for it. But the symmetry and the, uh, they caused me concern. Let's have a look at the next picture. So, 
the National Institute of Standards and Technology reported it, it investigated this stuff, and uh, they found no evidence for explosives. So we asked them, did you look? And they said, no, we did not look for evidence of explosives. And so other scientists started to look, and they got, uh, uh, sample, they got hold of samples of dust from the World Trade Center, and they found in every tested sample, they found evidence of thermite in a military-grade explosive called nanothermite, which cannot be made in a cave in Afghanistan. So architects and engineers started to take up this uh, line of questioning and say, when, uh, can you reinvestigate? We don't think you've done it properly. But unfortunately, our um, news media hasn't reported this. And at this stage of, uh, of proceedings, there was 2,000 of them. Um, and they put this banner, they, got, you know, they raised public support and stuff, and they put this, and they've done one in Central, uh, in Times Square as well. This banner was put exactly outside the New York Times. And not only has the New York Times and other newspapers and other media networks not reported this campaign, they have, um, they've, thanks, they've not... Um, They've not, they've not reported the campaign, they've not reported, so they've not reported the evidence or the campaign. So not, even if they think they're all monkeys and idiots, they could just say, oh, there's these guys doing this. But they've not done that either. Have a look at the next one. There's now 2,750. This um, has been published in, a, this, in the past six months in a physics journal, 300,000 views. And um, these have got proper scientists, you know, proper architects, proper uh, professor of chemistry from the University of Copenhagen. There's the, these are, aren't uncredentialed people. They're people like me. Uh, well, no, no, they're better than me because they've got academic credentials that, like professors and so on. So when I present my art uh, thing and people just give it short shrift because I'm not the orthodox history, I'm not... That's one thing because it's art. But these guys are the people that you would turn to to investigate this stuff and to know what's going on. And they need to know because they're putting buildings up and the buildings shouldn't be falling down from fire, because otherwise all of us are in danger every time we walk, in, walk into a, a, a skyscraper. Okay, the next up. This is um, how, what they told us happened. This is what they told us happened. They told us that airplanes hit the top section and then the whole building collapsed as though there was nothing un in, uh, underneath it. Now airplanes probably did hit those buildings, but the, they were designed Think of it a different way. If you have um, one structure, put it horizontally and call it a juggernaut and call it a small mini, what's going to happen in that collision? Next one. And it's not just architects and engineers. It's not just people like me who you can dismiss. These are people who work inside the system, who are military guys and pilots. There's a pilots for 9-11 truth. There's architects and engineers for 9-11 truth. There's firefighters for 9-11 truth. The truth is there. The people, what, what has gone on, it, it, they, they, don't, they don't tell you stuff, and then you don't know. I'm not going to suggest anything, I'm, because, because I don't want to start um, arguments. I'm just presenting you with some evidence, some information there, and, and you can ask your own questions. Everyone's got the internet, everyone's got Google, and everyone can figure it out. Is there another one? This is what happens with jet fuel, apparently, which is kerosene. Kerosene doesn't b help the building burn any hotter than... There we go. We're nearly done. We've got one more image and then we're done, I think. Thanks. Keep going. Let me finish that. The scientific method, that's what we've got. And this is, I learned the scientific method from these guys. I'm going to do the last couple just very quickly and let everyone go home. It's not, um, I'm, I mean, I, I anticipated a reaction like that, to be honest. People don't, I mean, maybe they need to go home, but 
But essentially what it's showing you here is that um, in the case of building seven, the third tower that you've not seen, this is it at the bottom. That building fell down and it's a fair old distance from the other towers and it fell down at 5.23 in the afternoon and people knew, people were being moved back because they knew it was coming down. They had foreknowledge that it was coming down and the evidence shows only one thing and we can all make our own minds out how we respond to that knowledge and the implications of that knowledge. But I felt it was, I, had, I think if you know it, I think you've got, I, th I brought it up here because it might not be quite the right context, but what is the right context? I think if you know stuff like this or you think stuff like this, you've got a moral responsibility to say something because nobody else is saying anything. I'm filling a vacuum here or I'm trying to fill a vacuum based up, because there is one in terms of uh, the information that we're presented. It takes months or, and weeks of planning to, uh, to, to stage a controlled demolition. You can't do it on the same day. And this one, this one's a very good one. But I've got a question here, okay? So if you, if you can see the top section of the building is tilting towards our, our left-hand side, which means there's no pressure on the right-hand side because the weight is going on the left-hand side, and yet it falls symmetrically. I've got a question about that. That doesn't... Uh, the way the planes knock down the, um, the towers is like taking an axe to the top of a tree and then coming back um, an hour later and finding that it's dissolved from the and you just have to pick up the sawdust. Yeah, Tom? That's the last one. <laughs> 